Hello everyone and welcome to the Monster Report, a show highlighting those entertaining creatures of film history. Today we have a special episode for you. We're joining you at Eastern Michigan University here in the Art Gallery where they have a special exhibit uh, highlighting King Kong at 90, 90 years old, if you can believe that was the original 1933 King Kong. And so this exhibit was set up here three hours from my own house. So you're here joining me and my three children. One of them, Deborah, is going to be my camera operator. And we're going to highlight a few things that they have here in this, in this small exhibit, but very cool, especially if you're a monster fan. And uh, it's definitely worth the chance to check out if you get the chance before they shut down on February 23rd of this year. But maybe when Kong reaches 100 and we're still around, <laughs> it'll have another exhibit, so we'll see about that. So we'll just highlight a few of the different items here, but definitely worth checking out. So come join us as we go along through this gallery. A lot of what you're gonna see here actually at this exhibit is not just some artwork, but lobby cards, magazines, any kind of memorabilia, any kind of uh, programming or promotional material uh, for the release of King Kong, Harryhausen, Lost World, a lot of really cool things. So looking at King Kong here, we've got the original uh, re-release that was in 1938, and I remember they actually had a trailer for some of these re-releases. So 1938, 1942, 1946, and this is one of the things about, you know, during that time when you didn't have home video and you didn't have television, uh, they these films would get another life in re-release in the theater. So they would gather the family together and friends and you'd go to the movies to see something that may have came out 10, 20, or 30 years uh, earlier than then. Disney also used this with a lot of their material as well. Over here, actually, Famous Monsters of Filmland, uh, the famous, famous Monsters, I should say, 1962. Very cool, talking a lot about uh, the Lost World and the Mummy, uh, Frankenstein, Alice in Wonderland, and of course, King Kong. So a lot of really cool things going on there. This is from the 1962 Famous Monsters. And also, coming over here, we have the British. So we even have some promotional material from international audiences. So very cool look to that uh, kind of poster that might be set up in 1933. So very historical artifact that you have here in very good uh, condition. And a lot of the other uh, items that we're going to see. Some are recreations, but most of these are from private collectors who have allowed this exhibit to display this and to uh, be able to be shown and seen by people like us and to, uh, and, and to come here to Eastern Michigan University to see it for no cost. So definitely worth uh, checking out here. Let's continue on. As I mentioned before, Lost World, one of Willis O'Brien's earliest works in the time before sound uh, movie uh, movies that were going on out there and his earliest stop motion work predating even King Kong. We have 1925's Lost World and this is a program book for the cost of 25 cents of the Lost World. So that is a very, very cool uh, item from this private collection. We've got a trade ad for the Lost World 1925, a program book. I know that during that time, these movie-going experiences were definitely a lot, you know, more than what we have now. You would have lobby cards, you would have program books, things like that. And of course, you also had cartoon shorts during that time. We have the famous Gertie the Dinosaur. I remember seeing Gertie the Dinosaur for the first time in a dinosaur documentary. I want to say it was called Hollywood Dinosaur Chronicles, and they showed uh, how Gertie the Dinosaur was one of the earliest animations, and of course, why not a dinosaur? And uh, we, if you get the chance to go to Disney World, you'll actually see a large version of, of Gertie, and I think they made a restaurant or something to that effect out of it. I don't know, because it was closed because we went during the height of the pandemic pandemic, but seeing a cell here printed on rice paper is uh, animation cell of Gertie the Dinosaur. So definitely part of the monster history, and this even predates the Lost World because this is 1914.
Something else that I remember actually in some of the documentaries of uh, checking things out for King Kong, the original, was some of the behind the scenes. How were they making King Kong? How were they making the visual effects for it? And there was a lot of people that, you know, had ideas of what it might be. One of the books that they have here actually is talking about the technical marvels of Kong, showing how they were getting shots of the Empire State Building and how they were, uh, you know, getting shots of Kong fighting with the, uh, the different dinosaurs and of course with the planes on the Empire State Building um, but one of the things about this book is it actually is full of false information intentionally for the audience so they didn't know actually the process of stop motion of how it was done so at that time people may have even been believing that there was a person in a gorilla suit playing the role and so uh, None of that was true. It was a very small miniature, but the illusion of what they were able to create during that time, even during the Depression era, was very cool to see how uh, they made that illusion. And I even remember a portion of a documentary talking about how uh, one of the filmmakers or one of the producers maybe said, uh, this, uh, this effect is so neat, it's so realistic that even the fur on King Kong is blowing in the wind, which was actually a mistake made by the stop motion people, and that's their hands working with the fur in between frames of footage, and that's what ends up happening. But if you want to go with that, go with that. Also talking about lobby cards, this is also very cool. We've got a colorized version of the original 1933 Kong, and of course printed in color, but it was a black and white film. Um, and of the 1933 original, you saw some of the re-releases in an earlier shot, but this is a lobby card from the very original. Very cool to see. And we have a great large uh, print of a photo of Mr. Willis O'Brien himself uh, working on The Lost World, 1925. So the very early days of stop motion, uh, predating even King Kong, working on a wooden table, and uh, you know, even well-dressed, I would say, not for the time, but for what we would consider today. I would have thought someone like this working in the backgrounds would be just t-shirt and jeans, right? But that's what we would think of today, because they're gonna get dirty and all of that, and they're gonna work under the hot lights, and uh, you wouldn't see him dressed like this today, but here he is in a button down and a bow tie even but uh, very cool to see this predating even King Kong but this technology led us to 1933's King Kong so a publicity uh, still from the film actually of King Kong with a famous T-Rex fight a colorized version for the re-release of 1940 in 1946 of King Kong using that same artwork just colorized the famous log scene we've seen that uh, in the original 33 and the remakes of 1976 and even Peter Jackson's 2005 of the men crossing the log and King Kong rotating it around until they you know fell into the pit so very iconic scene and this is from a uh, still from the 1933 and then I'm going to end up this section section here with a vinyl album this was actually jungle noises that was played in the theaters so the theater going experience like I've said before during that time was definitely something to be hold because it was a lot more than just you buy your tickets you sit down wait for the movie it ends and you go home and uh, you know that's the end of it they made this an experience so you would have this vinyl album playing probably you know several times over and over again for the people to hear the hoops and hollers and and bugs and birds and whatever else of the uh, animals in a jungle scene probably some roars of of uh, dinosaurs and King Kong maybe have even been in there be interesting to listen to this and see what it was some international publicity uh, marketing material. So we've got the Spanish uh, Herald of King Kong uh, 1933, also from a great private collection. You've got radio pictures there and a very interesting look for King Kong. I always like to see what they look like as international uh, versions of what they interpret the film to look like and how it would market to an audience. We have in here an Italian booklet, but very cool right here we have the Japanese double-sided bifold trade ad for King Kong and other RKO movies. Now what's interesting about this, of course, we uh, that are kaiju fans uh, are big fans of King Kong versus Godzilla and, the, and King Kong escapes, so when Kong actually uh, made its way to Japan to uh, fight with some of these kaijus, but what's even more interesting is that we, some of us know that there was some 
Lost Kong films made in Japan during the uh, <laughs> predating even Godzilla. And so those films are lost. We have some images of that, but we don't have the films, of course, so that would have been interesting to see what the Japanese audiences, uh, how they reacted to it, how they got some excitement to see a Japanese version of King Kong uh, that likely was a man in a suit. We don't know. I'm sure it was, actually. Um, but uh, to see what that film may have been like. But yeah, very cool to see how the Japanese actually had uh, this put together for their audiences. And now we get into some evolution of the stop motion uh, technique and how it went from Willis O'Brien to Mr. Ray Harryhausen. And on the first film that he was able to work on, which was Mighty Joe Young, which is an incredible, incredible successor to uh, the original King Kong. And so uh, there he is working a very young Mr. Ray Harryhausen. I think he died at the maybe ripe old age of 90, not too long ago. Would have been loved to have actually met him uh, before he passed. But Mighty Joe Young was a sensation. And so this drawing of this 80 foot helium filled uh, giant rubber Ape. That would have been, you know, a sight to behold uh, wherever they may have done this. But interestingly, we have photographs in this display of a promotional truck with a 12-foot mechanical Mighty Joe Young, a gorilla that was actually in a parade in Elkhart, Indiana. So Indiana, my neck of the woods, actually. That would have been interesting to see, and that was actually in 1949. Love to see more pictures from something like that that had happened in, you know, my neck of the woods. One of the uh, cool things about stop motion and the different special effects techniques uh, that could have been. So films that were unmade, actually, and one of these films is a film called War Eagles. So we have Duncan Gleason art here from this unmade uh, project. This film would have been uh, something to the effect of Vikings riding eagles and fighting with dinosaurs. So that would have been, you know, just from the get-go, I'm already interested in wanting to see, you know, this film already. But uh, as you go down here, you see the different concept art that would have went into this. Uh, this is actually done by Willis O'Brien. And we have the Duncan Gleason, like I mentioned before, Stan Johnson. And so to see what this, this film could have been like uh, is definitely a sight to behold. I always think of when I think of the eagles, you know, and people riding them and whatever else, giant eagles. I think maybe some Lord of the Rings, uh, you know, uh, in inspiration went into something like this. But yeah, there's, there's definitely a film that could be made again. Who knows? But uh, to see, you know, something that could have been made in the 19... This was a concept in 1939 even. So to see how uh, an epic film like that could have unfolded uh, definitely would have been an awesome thing to see. As Deborah's panning around here to some other concept art that was made by Mr. Willis O'Brien himself, we wanted to end up with uh, right here um, an unmade film of Cinerama, a 1950s um, concept for a dinosaur film that would have made been made in this technique called Cinerama. So we had, uh, you know, the the uh, Dynamation, I think they called it, which was a marketing way of talking about stop motion. Cinerama was another marketing technique, or at least uh, you know a, a way to get people into the theaters, which had theaters with three screens, three projectors to give an ultra wide perspective on this. So to see a film that was very wide to get a what we would almost think of as IMAX today uh, you know during that time I've only seen one film in Cinerama which was how the West was one and I could definitely tell how they were uh, pulling shots together to make this effect actually work and I imagine during that time it was something that was uh, pretty spectacular for audiences again some of the things that theaters used to do uh, to get you in now we have you know we have IMAX we have you know big sound and all of that but uh, the theater going experience had to have been something that was th these films were events for their times so we went from Willis O'Brien Ray Harryhausen to Tim Burton 
of all things. But Tim Burton, if you know, was definitely a big fan of stop motion. So we have some concept art for James and the Giant Peach and some other films that uh, Tim Burton used the stop motion effect uh, for. So this an unknown artist actually put some of these together. This is cool to see this even on yellow paper, you know, to see that this may have been just like he got a notepad out, whoever was working with Tim Burton at that time, to put this together for James and the Giant Peach. We have storyboard art, pencil art, uh, that was put together for this. Um, we even have some shots that would have been used for the Nightmare Before Christmas, um, which is another stop motion. Uh, great that he worked with Disney uh, to develop, and so that's very cool. But one of the other things that I remember uh, growing up actually was a short that Tim Burton made very early on of uh, the Vincent 1982, almost as old as I am, um, I remember seeing this film, which was actually narrated by Vincent Price, and the character is kind of a Vincent Price, uh, somewhat Edward Scissorhands almost kind of character, and I remember seeing this short, and I was like, well, that's very Tim Burton. Oh, it is Tim Burton. And Tim Burton before he was, you know, the Tim Burton that we knew from Beetlejuice, Batman, and so many other great films uh, that came out. So, uh, you know, the, you can see the inspiration of Willis O'Brien and Harryhausen going into uh, perfecting this uh, art and going into the future and uh, making it an entertaining experience for audiences in the films. But yeah, Vincent, if that's uh, not something you've had the chance to check out, uh, definitely look it up. For a boy his age, he's considered it a nice. But he wants to be just like Vincent Price. One of the first things you'll see actually walking into the doors of this exhibit is this Kong armature. Now this is not from the original 1933 Kong, it's not even been on film, but that doesn't take away from anything. This is a 2006 replica of the arm armatures that um, Bob Burns owns, the, the famous collector of great monster props and um, obviously miniatures. And so these are made up of what you would find in, in hardware stores. You have, you know, the bolts and screws, nuts and bolts, things like that, rack and pinion, uh, you know, uh, creations, dowel rods, uh, things that would be put together with the exception of the head that would have been definitely something that would have been shaped and molded and we're going to talk about that here in just a second on the sculpturing of how this, but this is the skeleton of what would become King Kong, you know, so we got to have some, uh, put some cotton and, and tie it with some string and uh, rabbit fur and, and then we get our King Kong effect, something that stands about 12 inches tall tall, uh, makes a creature that could be in the neighborhood of, you know, 30 to 50 feet tall. But while I've got you here, we're going to come over here to an image of, we have Marcel Delgado and the armature behind him and a sculpture bust of Marcel Delgado's King Kong. And uh, Marcel Delgado, one of the few uh, Mexican-American immigrants that would have uh, worked in the Hollywood industry. Not many, ma many of them worked in the Hollywood industry during that time. So to see the craftsmanship of what he brought to Kong, not just Willis O'Brien, who we always think of, but we have Marcel Delgado, and his name is definitely one in the credits when you uh, check out the 1933 Kong to look for. But uh, his handiwork is definitely part of it, the expressions of what Kong, his face, uh, was coming up with and all of that to give uh, the character of Kong, not just the creature of Kong, but the character of Kong, something more than just an angry, you know, monster. He actually had, you know, feelings towards uh, the, the lady, you know, he had uh, anger, he was showing definite emotions, and so we have him to thank for, uh, for that. We're actually going to wrap things up here because I could show off everything, but I want you to check it out for yourself. And again, if it's a chance that you have to get here to see this, definitely worth it. Uh, maybe it's an exhibit that will actually be set up at another location. We don't know, but uh, definitely look out for that. But uh, we're going to end up here with some Harryhausen work. So a photo of Harryhausen on the last film that he had the chance to work on, which was 1981's Clash of the Titans, the same year as I was born. And going across, we have artwork for the Allosaurus, we have artwork for some unmade films that were here with the uh, signature of Ray Harryhausen there, but I wanted ended up actually here. So um, this is going back to Willis O'Brien. So we have a storyboard of a concept for Frankenstein 
and King Kong. King Kong versus Frankenstein. And uh, so we have storyboards that were put together for that. And so if, again, you're a Godzilla fan and you probably already know this story, but if you're not, here we are. In a nutshell, we had the story, the idea that Kong was going to be fighting the Frankenstein monster, but if it's going to be a collaboration with the Japanese Toho filmmakers, it was going to be something that uh, they were going to probably put some marquee value into it. So we're going to put up King Kong versus Godzilla. But we need to do something to amp up the power of King Kong because he's smaller and so they've got to make him larger and maybe we can give him some abilities. So some of the Frankenstein abilities like the idea that electricity making uh, the Frankenstein monster come to life and electricity making him actually stronger, that got passed off to King Kong to give him an edge on Godzilla. But it is cool to see the ideas that uh, concept art turn into one thing and end up sometimes completely different, but that's where I'm gonna end us up here, which was this concept art of Willis O'Brien and eventually getting to the point of King Kong versus Godzilla. So this has been a very cool visit here to Eastern Michigan University, checking out King Kong at 90. Uh, definitely worth the time that it took to come up here, um, but uh, to see uh, you know some of the the evolution the publicity some of these stills that are out there yeah you can check them out but uh, to see them actually you know in front of you is definitely an experience to behold so I definitely encourage you to check it out and thank you for joining me in this uh, journey through this uh, exhibit here at Eastern Michigan University here on the Monster Report so like subscribe comment all of those great things catch the Monster Report on Facebook Twitter and on Instagram check out the things that we've got coming on this channel we are very close to that 100,000 subscriber mark and thank you for the support and everything that has gone into this. Uh, we are well into building that new studio space and it's because again of your support that we're able to do that. So for Nick Adam Poling, this has been another episode of the Monster Report. We will catch you next time.